Hello? Hello? Hello, are we live? I think we are. Well, I'm looking at I'm looking at YouTube to make sure. Yep, we are live, guys. Uh, so there's a 10 to 20 seconds lag, so you are live ready. Oh, great. Okay. Gregory, how's things? All right, Tim, how are you doing? I think, I think on an individual basis, we are, we are doing okay. Uh, it's tough working from home, running a media company, running, writing articles. But I think, you know, there's a lot of interesting things which are happening in the market, keeping us really busy. Um, I think in March and April was terrible, man. Like every, every few days, there's like, you know, an S&P, uh, some circuit breaker comes in and things like that. So challenging times for investors as well as for business owners. For sure, for sure. Um, anyhow, you know, I'm I'm a bit stressed out because we we had some technical difficulties just now. Um, so I'm hoping that people will find this live link where we're going to have this dynamic conversation. I think we should just give them a couple more minutes. Um, sorry to everyone who's dialing now. Um, we had some technical difficulties a few moments ago, um, but this link should keep us uh, live and through this presentation. Hmm. Just making sure. Let's give everybody a couple minutes. Right, I'm gonna to have to change my connection. Okay. Cool, all right, why don't we get started, Tim? Um, really quickly, before we get started, uh, thank you, Tim, for being with us today. Um, for those of you guys who don't know Tim, uh, Tim is the co-founder and managing editor of Dollars and Cents. Um, I am Greg, I'm the CEO and one of the founding partners of Endow Us. Um, really quickly on Endow Us, um, just a one, a two pager, we help people invest better so that they can live easier today and live better tomorrow. And very importantly, through retirement. Inviting people like Tim on the show is, um, is really great because we share a lot of values with what Dollars and Cents has been doing uh, for quite some time. Tim, do you want to quickly share about Dollars and Cents and sort of your journey and mission? Yeah, that's, of course. Um, so Dollars and Cents, uh, I, think, I think most of the guys here um, would probably have heard of our website. Uh, we are a site that um, aims to write content that help people make better financial decisions. So what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, me and the writers, is we basically uh, look at what's happening in the financial markets. We look at what's happening in Singapore on a personal finance basis. And then we try to cover the, the content, not so much from a, from a news angle. We, let, we leave this to the mainstream media, but we try to make sense of what uh, Singaporeans or people in Singapore would need to know about um, when it comes to all this uh, news that's happening. And, and obviously over the last two months, it has been quite, um, I mean, from a media perspective, it has been quite challenging because you know, we had three budgets this year, right? So usually we are all stressed out over just one budget, but it's three budgets this year. Um, I don't think we have seen, I think most of us who are like below the age of 40, you know, we have not seen stock market um, recession, stock market crash so quickly. Um, so this is unpre unprecedented. I think um, it, it also calls into question a lot of the assumptions, a lot of the investment assumptions that, you know, people have been preaching um, over the past five to 10 years uh, when we were actually on a bull run since the global financial crisis. So I think, uh, thanks uh, Gregory for, for really um, having this session because I think a lot of people are rightly um, worried about what's happening in investment markets. Uh, people are asking themselves whether they should go into the market right now or is it better to wait? And I think these are really important questions that we should you know, discuss. Yeah, for sure. Um... Just before we get started, uh, sorry, a few more, a few more things about Endow Us. So, what we do in our mission to help people invest better, to live easier today and better tomorrow, is we care about 
the access to the right products, um, advice so that you can reach your long-term financial goals and making sure that the cost is manageable. And we make this all very convenient at endows.com. Um, we are currently the first and only way to invest your CPF, SRS, and cash savings holistically, conveniently with expert advice and towards your life goals. So um, on the Endows platform, um, completely digitally, you can invest your CPF, SRS, and cash in global portfolios managed by the likes of PIMCO, Dimensional, Vanguard, Schroeder's, First State, and others. Um, Tim, you know, when we were preparing for this presentation, and, and it just so happened that Warren Buffett just, just had his annual meeting just a few days ago, uh, you, you gave this great example. Could you, can you walk us through this case study? No problem, Gregory. So like, uh, I think it's, it's funny that I, I didn't even know that, you know, the, the AGM was happening this week, but I think it's timely because uh, I, I wanted to share um, what actually it's like, you know, if you have a long-term investment um, approach and, and what, what you could do, how much money you could make. So I thought Berkshire is probably the best example. So, so here's the thing, right? What, so what happens if you invest like Warren Buffett since 1965? And I think the best way to look at it is to use Berkshire as our proxy because uh, Berkshire basically is, is Warren Buffett investment vehicle. So what, what would you do you know, how much would you have made if you invest like Warren Buffett since 1965? And I think um, for most of most people who obviously have been following the investment markets, um, you it, it shouldn't come as a surprise that you'll make a lot of money. But I think it's still a surprise uh, when you think about you know the kind of returns Berkshire have been obtaining since 1965. So assuming that you started investing since 1965, uh, Singapore's Independence Day. Um, your annualized return would be about 20% since 1965. So um, that's obviously great, you know, and, and it beats the S&P uh, 500, which, which is still at a very reasonable 10%. Um, so that, that's great, right? And most people would uh, love it. Um, if you want to put it in numbers, you know, if you invest $1,000 in 1965, your money would be worth about $26.6 .6 today. today. Uh, so about 27 times your original capital. So um, it's pretty amazing stats when you look at it. So this is what happened if you invest like Warren Buffett since 1965. You know, you invest $1,000 in 1965, you would be worth about 26 million today. Um, and then the next slide um, shows, uh, this is basically, I, I took it off uh, Berkshire's uh, annual report. So uh, this, is, this was as of 2017. And you can see the compounded returns is 20.9%. And uh, that's, you know, double the S&P 500, which is still a very reasonable 10%. Um, so at this uh, stage, you know, I think, I don't think I'm sharing anything interesting or useful right now, because I think most of you guys, uh, if you're re reading dollars and cents or, or and dollars for a long time, you would know that, you know, the kind of returns that, you know, Berkshire has given us over the last 50 years is, is, is ridiculous, right? Uh, but here's an interesting uh, talk that I want to put to all of you guys watching right now. So, you know, we on hindsight, we all know that uh, Berkshire would have been the best investments, uh, would have been the best investment to make for the last 50 years, right? So we all know that we have a crystal ball. We all know that right now. So let me just ask you guys a question and, and that's on my next slide. Um, what happens, you know, if you decide since, you know, you have on hindsight, this is how good uh, Berkshire have performed. So you have, you decided that, you know what, I'm going to increase my return and I'm going to trade on two times margin since 1965. So for example, um, you, you've been investing for about 10 years and your portfolio is now up to $1 million and it's obviously doing well, right? Nobody's going to deny that. And you think to yourself, you know what? You know, it's great return and I should just increase my exposure. So I, I borrow $1 million on margin so that, my, um, so that my portfolio is $1 million, but I borrow $1 million on margin so that my portfolio exposure is worth $2 million now. So what happens if you decide to invest in Berkshire on two times margin since 1965? I, I'll leave you guys to think for about a few seconds how much more you would make, you know? Remember I said that, you know, you would have made $26 million based on $1,000. So now I'm just doubling uh, the exposure by taking on 
uh, a times two leverage, right? So here's the answer, and it's on my next slide. If you decide to do margin on two times, your return today would be zero dollars. So you will have nothing. Your portfolio will be worth nothing as of today. And the reason is very simple. Um, simply because there will be at least two periods in time where our entire portfolio will be wiped out if we use margin. And that has been stated from 1973 to the January 1975, Berkshire um, stocks actually went down by 59.1%. So assuming you, know, you were sitting on great returns, you have a portfolio worth a million dollars during that period. And so you, you borrow times on, you leverage on times two. So you have a 2 million exposure, your, your portfolio would have been wiped up. You would have been on, sitting on losses. You probably would have to top up some of the losses as well. You know, uh, during the 1987 uh, uh, October crisis, uh, Berkshire stocks went down by about 37.1%. Uh, during the 1998-2000, I think this is the ASEAN financial crisis, if I'm not wrong, um, it went down almost 50%. And during the GFC, you know, for a period of about... Um, a few months period, it went down by about 50%. So what, what is my point here, right? My point here, and, and I think, um, next slide. Um, my point here would be that, um, and, and sorry, just to quote, and I just would read off what Warren Buffett, anyway, just to put it clear, uh, this isn't my own, um, this isn't my own insights, all right? This is something which Warren Buffett himself has warned investors in, 2017, which, and I will just read out what he said because he explains it very clearly. The table that you're seeing right now offers the strongest argument against using borrowed money to own stocks. So there's simply no telling how fast stocks can fall in a short period of time. And you can see, you know, even if your borrowing are small and your positions aren't immediately threatened by the plunging market, um, you would be scared by the headlines and the commentaries, right? And, you know, you would be worried and I think um, that really just sums up uh, a few pointers. And um, I need a couple of things, uh, Gregory, sorry, the next slide. And this is really the three things that I just want to uh, remind investors as you're watching this, right? Um, number one, your investment in Berkshire, had you made it, would definitely not have been a bad investment, right? Nobody would say that it's a bad investment. I have deliberately choose the best investment you could have made since 1965. So your investment is obviously good. Your strategy would have even looked great most of the time. So, so let me make this really clear. Investing in Berkshire and taking a margin of two times on your investment would have looked wonderful most of the time you would be sitting on insane profits most of the time and, and it would have looked like the right decision, the right investment decision. But the scary thing is that ultimately your investment strategy was still disastrous and it would have cost you $26 million. And that's, that is the scary thing um, when you think about it because a lot of, a lot of us invest based on investment strategies that work really well during the good times, right? A lot of us, uh, you know, the last time we have a global financial crisis was 12 years ago, 2008, 2009. So that's almost, that's more than a decade ago. And, and in this decade, you know, I've seen a lot of investment strategies that have looked good, that have looked smart, you know, borrowing just to leverage, just to get the additional returns on what we think would be a safe, um, predictable asset class. So it could be bonds, it could be REITs. And a lot of people, they, you know, it's easy to look good during a, when a market is doing well. And, and you know, if you had times two trade on margin for Berkshire, you, your strategy would have looked really good over most period. Um, but ultimately, you would have still make a loss. Um, Gregory, I think it's next slide. And I think 
and and this really just sums up what you know um I want to say, which is there are many strategies that look wonderful most of the time, but ultimately they don't work. And I think that's the scary part. Um, think of it as an analogy, you know. Um, imagine um imagine you you we fancy ourselves as good car drivers. So um, I don't do this, but imagine if you know I have a really good fast car and every day in the expressway, I drive at 150, 160 kilometers, right? And I, I, I reason to myself that, you know, I'm a good driver. I have never gotten into a car crash before and I can manage speed. Um, and that's probably true, you know, for one year, two years, three years, four years, I might, I might never have an accident, um, even though I might be driving at 150 kilometers every day. And maybe the police just don't catch you still, right? But you see, all it takes is one day, something happens, something within that could be out of my control, right? May not even be within my control, something that's out of my control to happen. And, and you know, my car crash and I might, be, I might be dead, you know? And that's exactly what's the same thing with using leverage, right? You know, there are many strategies like leverage tra trading that looks really good most of the time. And that's great, but the problem is they don't work all the time. And, and I think Gregory, I mean, that's just what I wanna share across the day, you know, um, because it's shocking that someone can invest in Berkshire since 1965, maybe just take a times two exposure and his portfolio would be worth $0 today because he would have been wiped out at, at, at least two periods of time in the last 50 years. Yeah, uh, Tim, I think, you know, I think you make a great point. And I would just like to add that greed is usually the downfall of investors, right? As, as investors, we need a strategy that we can invest across all of our money. Uh, you know, we want, to, we want to invest across all of our money and all of our wealth, so our core wealth, because if we don't, you know, it's very hard for that money to make a meaningful difference in your life. So a lot of times, you know, I see people and, you know, some clients that we've had, I see them hold mostly cash and then they'll take 20% of their wealth and they will invest in maybe a Berkshire levered 2X as an example and try and make these outsized returns. But what they're doing is they're dragging their entire portfolio along with, the, with all of that cash drag. So what you need to be, and I'm just gonna bring us back a few slides uh, to your first slide. Um, what you need to be comfortable with is taking risk with more of your money, not taking leverage on that risk. So you wanna, you wanna, fig you wanna figure out how to take compensated risk in markets be extremely diversified, manage cost, of course, be very patient so that you can collect, you can collect the benefits or you can collect the, what they call the risk premium from taking that compensated risk. And you know, this, this slide actually shows us the power of compound interest, right? A 20% return for 65 years will get you 27,000 times your money, just a 20% return. And what a lot of people try to do is they try and make those outsized returns, but not on all of their wealth. And you know, we all know the power of compounding um, and it takes 10 years to double your money at a 7.2% return. So that's just math. It takes 10 years to double your money at a 7.2% annualized return. But if you only invest 20% of your wealth, you need to generate an almost 25% annualized return to double your money every 10 years. And that is just unreasonable because the best investor in our life, uh, the best living investor we know in the world, Warren Buffett, has generated a 20% annualized return. So thinking that you can continuously generate, you know, an, an outsized return when we're all facing the same market and there are reasons why, you know, facing the market is, is you know, in our view, um, 
highly likely to fail. So it doesn't matter if your strategy is, is um, it doesn't matter if your strategy is, is looking at economic data and trying to time markets or levering on safe assets, you're not taking that compensated risk and what appears to be a safe asset or a foolproof strategy is likely to hit, well, you know, I like your, I like your car driving analogy, is likely to hit a pin in the road and these black swan events happen more often than any statistical model can predict. Likely to hit a pin in the road and boom, you're dead. So um, I'll let you continue, Tim. Sorry for interrupting. Um, you no, know, Greg, I, I think you, what you said is absolutely correct, right? So a lot of people, uh, what they do is that, as what you mentioned, they don't, they don't invest enough. And so for the little that they do invest, um, they try to compensate for the returns that they want by taking on leverage on, on products because uh, they want that return. They want that 20% or, or more per annum, um, but they are not willing to, yeah, I mean, 20% is a lot, right? So, but, but people want that because they want to grow their wealth quickly. Um, and, and so they buy into investment strategies. Um, I have this slide right now, um, which talks about REITs because I, I felt that, you know, it's, it's easy for me to talk about Berkshire um, and in a lot of us Singapore investors, we may not be able to relate to it as much because it's a long time ago and, you know, we just can't see it. But I think REITs is something that I think most Singapore investors are familiar with. I think most people watching uh, this video would probably know about REITs, probably invested in it, probably already know these stats as well as I do. So, but let me just show it um, a little bit. So this is off a Dawson's Sense article that we wrote um, sometime in April. And it, it shows, right? So, um, so, so since the start of the year, um, unfortunately, the REITs market has dropped about no, it has declined by as much as 34%, you know, and uh, since then it's recovered a little bit. So you're probably looking at a, at a drop of about 20% or so right now, but at its lowest point, it has dropped by about 34%. So, I mean, I don't know about you guys, 34% may not look like a lot because I just talked about how much Berkshire has dropped, but, you know, if you're investing and you, on, if you are investing on margin, uh, that, would be, that would be terrible, right? That would be an insane loss. Uh, and 34% is across the market, right? So if you look at um, the next slide, um, it talks about individual stocks. So if you, if you don't, um, sorry, this is, okay, so this is, this is the ETFs. So the ETFs are all down by, you know, at least 20% or more. Um, and that's a diversified uh, portfolio to begin with. And if you don't diversify your portfolio, um, you would see that your stocks would have fallen by, so on the next slide, you know, and, and this is how much your stocks would have fallen by, right? This is, this is the 10 worst performing REITs. And, uh, you know, as much as, you know, a lot of them, more than 30%, uh, some more than 50% as well. So that would have been pretty disastrous, you know, if you had invest um, not just in REITs, but you didn't diversify your portfolio. Uh, just for your information, there are 10 best performing REITs and it doesn't look good also. So it's not a situation where I'm just choosing, I mean, I'm choosing the 10 worst guys, but it's not like, you know, the 10 best guys are doing much better. Um, and, and, and it's quite scary numbers because, you know, a lot of these drops just happened over the last two months. It's not like it fallen across the last one year or six months, you know, if, if, if it was dropping since, you know, last year, you know, we could reason to ourselves that the stock hasn't been performing well and, you know, you know, investors should have exited their position early if they didn't feel good about it. But these guys that we are seeing here, they, they dropped, I don't have the actual math, but I think within two weeks to a month, you know, it, it just, it's just like that, two weeks to one month. And, you know, it's great to say that some of them might recover. I, I'm not an expert. Maybe some of the guys here will recover. I, I, I believe some of them would recover. But the problem here is that if you're leveraging on it, you know, similar to the Berkshire's example I gave earlier today, um, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't be in a position to, to wait for the recovery. So you, you would have been 
maybe out of the market by now. So that's really the scary thing. Um, the next slide just shows. Um, no, sorry, Tim. I think that's your last. That's your last slide here. Oh, okay. Next is yeah. So, um, <laughs> so I, I just want to say that um, this is some of the things that. Okay, I, I just want to clarify a, a, a thought now because I'm sure some of you guys are going to ask me that question, or, or you are, you're asking this right now in your head, which is that am I saying never ever leverage? That's not really the point, you know. A lot of us borrow money to do things that we need, right? So, um, I have a home mortgage. So obviously, I, I I'm staying in a house right now, and I own owe the money. I owe the bank some money for buying this house. So it's not about borrowing money, which is wrong. You know, borrowing money to buy a house, borrowing money for your education, those things are important, and sometimes we do that. But I think Warren Buffett has mentioned this many times in the past, and I would just basically parrot what Mr. Buffett has said, which is that it's generally speaking a really bad idea to borrow to invest long term. Okay, it's a bad idea to invest over the long. It's a bad idea to borrow in order to invest in the stock market over the long term because over the long term the stock market is going to give you ups and downs, and the downs, you know. They always say, right, you take the stairs up, you take the lift down. So you might do well, climb up the stairs, 10, 11 stories. It feels good, you know, you're doing well. And suddenly the lift brings you down and you're back to square one. And if you're on, and you're, if you're investing money that you can afford to lose and you can continue to invest, that's fine. But if you're investing money that you can't afford to lose because you're borrowing that money, then you're in trouble. You know, um, I covered a lot of, uh, forex traders. I cover a lot of traders and I interview them um, all the time. And I think uh, one of the guys that I, I, I do remember, uh, Mr. Colin Sell, uh, Colin Sell is a quite well-known trader. He said this thing in, in my interview with him and he says that he never leaves his position. He never leaves, because forex trader leverage all the time, right? Every single forex trader or CFD trader leverage. And, and Colin was sharing with me that one of the lessons he learned, I don't know if he learned the lesson the hard way or the easy way, but one of the lessons he learned is never to leave an open trading position overnight or leave an open trading position when you're going on a holiday and all those things, which makes sense because if you're going on a holiday, the last thing you want to be doing is, you know, borrowing $100,000 to size up your position. Something happened in that five days, you're in Maldives, you come back and not only have you lost your entire portfolio, but you're also now owning the trader, the, the broker, some money, right? So that makes sense. And I, I think a lot of Forex traders, they, they practice this kind of risk management. So I think that's great. But you see, the problem with long-term investors is that if you're borrowing money and you're going to borrow for, to invest over a long period of time, you know, can you really say that I'm going to manage my investments carefully every single day, every single week for the next 10, 20 years? Because if you can, you're probably a full-time fund manager. But if you can't, then it's just a matter of time before something like what just happened last month would just happen again. Yeah, but uh, Tim, so I mean, I have, a, I have a slightly different view on that. I, I wanted to bring up two points. So one, one is that you guys have to realize that when something goes down, the down is asymmetrical to the up. So when you leverage you are accentuating the, 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 the down. So by, for a very crude example, let's say I have $100 today and it goes down by 50% because I invested in uh, Lippo Mall's trust, which we're looking at right here. In order for me to recover my capital, it has to go up from the $50 that it is now by 100%. So I went down 50%. I need to go up 100% to get back to where I was. And, you know, I mean, my philosophy and, and coming from personal experience and from very, very good guidance, very fortunately from a lot of mentors, is that, you know, why would you, why would you try, if, you know, and, and from, a, from an evidence-based approach, I think trying to trade very, very frequently has a very large dispersion of possibilities. So your ability to outperform, you have an ability to outperform and you have ability to underperform. But the fact of the matter is, 
even with professional managers. So if these are people who get paid purely to look at the markets and look at companies every day and take bets and they get paid, they, this is how they make their salary. So they could work at a professional fund manager, they could work at a hedge fund. Um, over a 15 year period, only about generally about 15% will outperform the market, right? And these are people who are trading and doing this full time. So only about 15% will outperform the market. And I actually saw a statistic where, you know, over, over long periods of time, so over a 15 year period, the number of people that outperform the market is less than pure random chance. So, you know, we like to say, like, we're not saying don't trade, don't try to express your views. But when it comes to your core family wealth, right, when it comes to your real ambitions of, I want to invest for my child's education, or I want to invest for my next home or my first home, or I want to invest for my retirement, or I want to, I want to help my parents, you need to have a strategy with a certainty of outcomes. Yeah. And I would say, you know, build your foundation, build your house. And then on top of that, if you have excess capital and you want to try and make outsized returns, no one is stopping you. But I think, you know, and, and, and even more so when on this topic of investing through financial crises, it is important to have a strategy, that core strategy in place that will not be affected by these crises. And that means taking the right amount of risk based on your goals and not employing, well, I think, you know, Tim has really nailed home the point that you should not be using uh, leverage or you should, be, you should be using leverage extremely carefully um, especially if you're trading in equity markets. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch gears slightly um, and talk about what the markets have done. So this is the markets in the last six months. Uh, you know, we've gone up, we've gone down, we've had some of the worst days on record. The, the, uh, the purple line here is the S&P 500. The light blue line is the STI, which is the, the bottom one. So the STI performance in US dollars uh, for the last six months has been about negative 20% versus negative 8% for the uh, S&P 500. And then finally, the MSCI All Country World Index, which is the universally accepted market cap weighted index for developed and emerging market companies, a uh, stock market index. Um, and, you know, I really wanted to point out, and, you know, we use this, we use this uh, chart in an earlier presentation, my colleague, uh, Sam, who's been an invest, so he's our chief investment officer. Uh, before in Dallas, he was the CEO and chief investment officer of Morgan Stanley Investment Management in Asia. And he was recounting, you know, numerous black swan events that he has personally been through. But what's really incredible about what we've experienced in the last few months is that, you know, three of the worst 10 days historically have happened in the last three months. So we have the flash crash here of 1987. And then we had the two days in March. I don't remember if it was, I remember there were two Black Mondays. I don't remember exactly which day of the week it is now, but where we hit all those circuit breakers. And, yep. and, and you know, I started investing right at the start of the global financial crisis. And Tim, I don't know about you, you might've been about the same timing. Um, so I started investing right at the start of 2007 and I wrote up the end of 2007 and then I was betting on, you know, single stocks. I was very lucky. My first stock ever was Amazon, but I sold it after three days after it went up by 7%. So I missed out on what Amazon is today. Um, I ended up playing around and speculating in a lot of stocks, uh, making, you know, 10, 15% in a single day and feeling really, really good about myself. And then, uh, you know, I finally caught, I guess, the, the, the nail. I finally, you know, drove over the nail in the road. And, um, 
ended up in a, in a solar stock, which I ended up riding out until bankruptcy. So I bought it, I think for the first time at $70, it went up to $100 and, uh, and I was trading it along the way. Uh, I was day trading it along the way. And I was, you know, I was in college at the time um, in the US. And then I just wrote it all the way down until it was bankrupt. Uh, the, the guy who founded the company was the first billionaire in China and um, was like the king of solar. So I was really, you know, that, that really taught me a lesson and, and, and really drove me, I think, on the path that I've been on since then, which is finding an evidence-based way of growing wealth in a, holistically so that uh, for the long term. Um, and that's using the power of compounding, strategic passive asset allocation, everything like that. But what I want to what I want to point out here is that we experienced some of the biggest down days ever. I had never experienced a circuit breaker in my life. I, I'm not talking about the circuit breaker we're living through now in Singapore. I'm talking about the stock market circuit breaker on the S and P 500, right, which is the 500 biggest stocks in America and which overlaps very closely with the 500 big, biggest companies in the world, right, um, and. And it was shocking because it didn't just happen once, it happened multiple times in a row. And that was after you know, federal and fiscal um, monetary policy trying to stop this market from, from this crazy, this, these crazy movements. So you know, this is not easy to live through. And I completely appreciate how difficult this is to live through. I will say though that uh, you know, if if I had just started investing, and I don't know about you, Tim, I don't know what you did with your portfolio, but if I was if I had just started investing, let's say at the beginning of this year, for the first time, I would have been really, really, really freaked out, and I probably would have sold some of my holdings because I would never have experienced seeing my wealth go down by ten percent in a single day. And then a week later, doing it again and again, right? Um, but I think you know, I've now I now understand the fundamentals of investing and what makes a successful long-term investor. And I'll go through that because it's really about this talk is really about investing through financial crises. And by the way, everyone, um, there is the YouTube live under uh, the YouTube chat underneath. Um, and you can ask questions there and we'll try to address them um, after we get through some of the content. And it's really difficult. Every single day, every single minute of this time, your palms are sweating and you're trying to figure out what to do. But, and, and someone told me this analogy and it's a great one. What if I, you know, what if you owned your own home? So Tim, you own your own home. What if every morning I came and knocked on your door and said, Tim, Today, your house has gone down in value by 3%. Do you want to buy or sell? Do you want to sell? Okay, you might say, okay, you know what? No, it's okay. I'll hold. Then 30 minutes later, I'll, I'll come back and knock on your door and say, Tim, your house has gone down by another 3%. Your house has gone down by 6% today, and all your neighbors have just sold. What, what do you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good. It's it's, it's a good thing. Well, and, and that's the problem with the stock market, right? Because basically, that's what's happening every single day. We're looking at the stock market, right? No, so I, firstly, every single second, every single second. Every, so yeah. I think the the first thing I would do is I'm glad that there isn't someone like that knocking on my door every day. Um, or I'm not going out there looking to sell my house just because I get four or $5,000 more than I paid for it, right? Because then that would be a really bad way to, I mean, I would make money. Um, so so I, I can just turn the conversation and say, you know, Greg, if you come to me every, I wouldn't say every day, but maybe just every every week and you tell me, hey, Tim, um, I'm willing to pay you $3,000 more for your house if you don't mind selling it to me right now. And I think most people would say no, because even though that's a paper profit, which I can cash in, the truth is that if I sell my house at three thousand dollars, there's nowhere for me to stay. Um, I will no, not. You be need able to. You need to buy another house. You need to park need to that money somewhere. House. But in your case, you need to park your family somewhere. Yeah, and 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 I mean the the other way to look at it, even if even if let's say I I don't stay in that 
house. I don't live in a house that I am currently in. People, generally speaking, understand that when they buy a house, they are buying it for the long term, right? So most people are not looking to sell it after two years, three years. Um, most people don't even look to sell it after three, four, five years. So I think if they have the, can have the same kind of approach towards investing in the stock market, um, and they, they would be generally speaking a lot more successful than what you mentioned, you know, trying to time the market, um, trying to time the market um, all the time. I think, um, I mean, you mentioned that, you know, you live through a circuit breaker. I, I think we live through two circuit breakers right now, right? So we have the physical circuit break breaker that we are living through, and then we have what we've seen in the stock market. And I, am, I just recall the fact that, you know, on average, you look at, at a recession happens one about seven to eight years. Um, and and if, you are, you, if you have an investment horizon of about 30 to 40 years, you, want, you are going to see about five of these stock market crash, crashes. And, and in order to be a successful investor, you have to come out of all these five recession in a good enough state. Because if any of this stock market recession wipe out your retirement portfolio, um, that's it, right? That's it. So I think that that is something which a lot of investors right now, young investors or even older investors, they're starting to realize it. They saw their portfolio go down by 10, 20, maybe 30%. And, and people are starting to realize that, you know, I need an investment strategy that not only works for me during the good times, but an investment strategy that also worked for me during the recession. Yeah. Uh, Tim, I'm, gonna, I, I'm conscious of the time. We have a bunch of good questions coming in. Um, a lot of them are about REITs, actually. So um, I'm going to try to consolidate some of these questions and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, have, have us discuss. So what do you think about leveraging a smaller amount, let's say 20%, instead of you know, 2x? And then also... Uh, why are REITs, uh, are REITs dying? Like, will they come back? Should REITs, should we lay off REITs in the immediate future? So I'll take the second question really quickly. Uh, so I think that guys, we need to remember the power of the market pricing mechanism, right? So it's very important as an investor to remember the power of the market pricing mechanism. Every day in just stock markets alone, over 450 billion US dollars are circulating trying to find price. So if I ask you today, if I ask you today, you know, is Eagle Hospitality REIT going to go up more or Amazon? What would your answer be? So Tim, what would your answer be? Is Eagle, gonna, Eagle Hospitality REIT uh, Trust going to go up more or Amazon? It's gone down by 75%. What do you think? <laughs> I, I would rather, um, I can't say who will go up more, but I would obviously rather invest in Amazon. <laughs> okay, well, okay. The answer is that the market prices in this information, right? So this $450 billion is constantly trying to price risk. And if you say, oh, uh, something is undervalued, you're betting against that $450 billion, you know, and that could be college students, first time investors, it could be you and me, it could be professional managers, it could be GIC and Tomasic. It could be the biggest pension funds in the US. We're all trying to price this risk. And it may be the fact that, okay, Eagle Hospitality Trust, I, I don't know what the, what the current dividend is, but the dividend I, I imagine is enormous now. I'm guessing over 10% because the price has gone down by 75%. So the market has already priced in that, oh, you know, even though they're paying 10%, we believe that the compensated risk of owning Eagle Hospitality Trust is about the same as owning Amazon at the current price, which people may say is very inflated. Why not own the entire market instead? Take what we call the equity risk premium and own the entire market instead. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know if that answers I hope that can answer some of the questions we've seen about REITs, um, about leverage, leveraging less, Tim. What do you think about leveraging less? So really quickly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up that asymmetric, 
that asymmetric uh, relationship again. So if something goes down by uh, if something goes down by 50%, it doesn't mean that it only takes it has to go up by 50% to recover. So by leveraging, you are um, you are accentuating the downs versus the ups. Now I I I, I have to say that. Um, and a lot of people, and there are, there are even ETF strategies that play, you know, slight leverage, or they might buy equities and then buy bonds and lever up on the bonds, or some ETFs. And I think there's another question about this, where it's like a three X levered ETF. Um, I would just quickly say that, you know, in in the, I would quickly say that uh, the partial leverage is is okay in that you are limiting the downside but in the case of a 50 percent down and let's say you levered by 50 percent you're now 75 percent down and equity markets have gone down by over 50 percent three times since the 70s so are you willing to take that much of a down to go up and then i would also say that companies borrow money at the company level you know, these REITs are levered and the market is constantly pricing the leverage as well, the gearing, they call it at the company level and saying, okay, we think the equity of the company is worth this much. So I would tend to stay away from leverage, um, especially with that core wealth that I keep on talking about. But yeah, Tim, go ahead. Good question. Um, I would just, I think Warren Buffett has mentioned earlier, right? Um, even a small amount of borrowed money is not going to make you sleep well at night. So um, I think he answered that, but I, I would just start to add in a little bit of my own thoughts, right? So we talked about the three times ETFs, um, the Rachel DLCs, for example, you can, you can trade that on the Singapore exchange, right? And uh, I wrote about DLC, so I'm quite familiar with it. And, and the fact of the matter is that DLC, and if you ask anyone who's trading it or buying it, they'll tell you the same thing. It's a short-term tool. It's not a long-term tool. You don't buy a DLC and hold it for 10, 20, 30 years. You don't even hold it for a few months, right? Um, it makes no sense. It's for day trading or maybe on a weekly month trading, uh, five days period, you trade the DLC. So uh, the DLC uses three times, five times, and seven times trading. So that, that answers that question already, right? Can you use the DLC uh, three times trading? Yes, you can. You know, the exchange allow you to trade that. But remember, that's a short-term trading tool. So if you're looking to hold it for like 10 years, it makes absolutely no sense. And, and you probably can't even do that. Or, or you know, um, you probably will have to pass the exam or something to even start trading that. Uh, so that's the first thing with regards to using leverage on like three times on ETFs. The second part about, you know, just using a small leverage and Greg, you mentioned maybe just uh, point two instead of, you know, type two. You know, I think the question we've got to ask ourselves is that why are we using the leverage, right? So even if it's point two, what's the reason for using the leverage? And I can only think about it on two reasons. Number one, you want a higher return, correct? So for example, you, if you're trading bonds and, and people trade bonds all the time, and you're talking about high net worth accredited investors, they buy corporate bonds and, and in order to increase their returns from a 4% coupon payment to like say 8%, what they do is that they leverage on it. So the banks, the bank lends them money. They use the same money to increase their position from $200,000 to $500,000 and their returns from 4% coupon payments to potentially 7%, 8% after interest costs. So the first reason is to increase your return. That's the reason why people want to um, leverage. But as you know, whenever you want to increase your return, you take higher expected risk. So that is already, in a way, that's already priced into a return. A lot of people don't instantaneously connect it. So what they think about is that, hey, you know, this is a safe product. It's a bond product, for example. And hence, it's safe. And hence, I will leverage on it to get a higher return on a safe product. But what they don't realize is that instinctive, immediately, once your expected return is higher, you're taking expected higher risks. And, and that risk is already priced in. It's just that, you know, if the market is predictable, if the market is on a bull run, the strategy would probably work. I'm not saying it doesn't work. It probably work. 
But it there will come a day where it doesn't work. If there will come a day because the market doesn't just go this way. Look at any stock market chart and it's this, right? And, and that's the problem, you know, um, with, with leveraging even a small amount of money. And, and the last thing is, and I guess this is just more on a psychological mindset is that I'm not sure about Gregory, but like for me, if I lose money, I don't feel good already, right? Like mm. I know it's paper loss. I know that everyone is losing the same money, but I just don't feel happy, okay? And, and that's on money that I actually own. That's on money I actually have. Imagine right now, I borrow money from Gregory and I say, hey, Greg, just lend me some money and I'll invest in it. Mm. You know, that feeling would be, you know, it's really a crappy feeling feeling like you lost your own money, let alone someone else's money, which by the way, you have to return with interest. So I, I would say, um, you know, I would say that you can, you can do these, what I call crazy things with a very, you know, very um, outsized return possibilities on again, the money that you don't need for the long term. And I think there is a question here around long-term investing, um, and you know you need you need to you need to capture basically okay back to the housing the house question. Companies are assets. They own assets. They provide goods and services to society. They employ people. They pay them salaries. And they are a livelihood for those people. They provide you know, goods and services to their customers. They make more money. They try and increase shareholder value. This is the economic system. And yes, these prices fluctuate a lot. But you really need to sit like as you own your home and you're sitting in your home right now. You really need to find that por a portfolio that is suitable for your goals. So that these short-term fluctuations do not knock you off the rail. And by using leverage, you are pushing yourself closer to the edge of that rail. Um, I just really want to, I really want to, uh, I have a bit more content here that I want to get through um, before we switch back over to questions. And I'm conscious of the time. We're almost at an hour. But, you know, typically... Um, after a 15 day decline, and, and we've already seen this materialize in, in the recent days, you see a very, very quick bounce. Now, I don't really like thinking about, you know, like, you, oh, this, this 15 day decline happened, so it's definitely gonna bounce, but it has shown that the markets tend to overreact and then readjust and find their equilibrium but they tend to overreact and try to sort of adjust to all the information that it's consuming constantly. So I would just say, you know, when things look like everything's on fire, you don't run for the hills. You need to remain invested and think about your goals and why you were investing in the first place. Uh, really quickly, then oftentimes people say, but we're heading for a recession and we are heading for a recession. A technical recession. So a recession means two quarters of negative GDP growth. And what have we seen in recessions typically in terms of stock market performance? On average, a slight increase in stock market performance. But why? The reason is the markets are a leading indicator. They run ahead of they run ahead of the economy. And they are constantly consuming this information ahead of time and pricing in the economic expectations of the future. What we, do, I mean, every recession is different. I mean, you can look down this chart, you know, the amount of GDP decreases, the amount the market goes up or down during the recession and, the, and how it recovers out of recession really varies from recession to recession. So I'm not gonna tell you, oh, you know, we're definitely gonna have a slight market increase uh, once we enter our technical recession this time around, no one has any idea. But what we do know is that the markets are cyclical. Coming out of a recession, they tend to go up, and they tend to go up in a higher rate than um, than what is typical. So in a five-year period, over 120% uh, on average. 
will it definitely go up 120% this time? Definitely not. Um, you know, zooming out, we look at annual stock market returns. Um, 2020 Q1 is here, negative 21%. It's now less than that in terms of the down. On average, the stock market returns is 7 to 9% annualized. But as you can see on this chart, it is very rare that the stock market actually returns us 7 to 9%, <laughs> right? I mean, we're swinging around from positive 40 to negative 40 to positive 30 to negative 13 um, and so on and so forth. And then, you know, positive 27% last year, negative 21% in the last three months. But the economic machine still works, right? Are we going to produce more goods and services as a society 10 years, 20 years from now? And if the answer is yes, and I saw some questions about quantitative easing and all the cheap money being printed, if the answer is yes, you need to be an asset owner. You need to be an asset owner and participate in the collective human ingenuity, right? It's the collective Basically, we all work for companies and we're all buying goods from other companies to serve our lives or to serve our company. By owning the assets of the stock market, you're owning the collective human effort to improve lives. So I would say try and tune out the noise. Figure out how much risk you can tolerate. If you cannot tolerate negative 40%, then you should not be invested in stocks, full stop, let alone a single stock. Um, you know, uh, people who have come to our webinars or my webinar specifically would have seen this chart before, but it's very important. And, and this, this talk is really about investing through crises. It, and, it, you know, we, we originally produced this, uh, this uh, research and then it got picked up by the Business Times. It was republished in the Business Times. And then actually just a few days ago, we re-updated uh, re it for the COVID crash. So this is of the worst investor ever where he only he or she only invests a hundred thousand dollars every time the market crashes by 20 percent or more pretty horrific so uh, from 1973 until uh, 2020 he invests a hundred thousand dollars every time the market crashes by 20 percent or more through all of these crazy crises and wars and things like that. But let's talk about the last section. Sorry, sorry, so, Greg. You're, you're saying that he invests before the stock market crash, right? Correct, just at the before. peak. Yeah. Just, just so, at the peak. So it's, it's not, because I, I think you you mentioned that he invested when, when the stock market crashed. So this is oh, when, before yeah. the, So this is before the stock market crash, he was so unlucky, he invested 100,000 and then the stock market crash. Correct, yeah, exactly. So let's say he, you know, let's let's just paint a story for him. So in 1973, he, he got inheritance from his dad, or from his grandpa, $100,000. His grandpa was, I don't know, quite wealthy, $100,000. And the market goes down by 41%. Okay, uh, carry on with life. Um, he wins, uh, he wins the lottery, okay, uh, $100,000, he invests in the stock market, it goes down by 20%. And the stock market we're using here is the MSCI world, which tracks developed markets globally. Um, carry on, and, uh, and he, he hits retirement, so it's 1999, uh, and he invests $100,000 just before the dot-com crash. So really, really unlucky guy. 2007 comes along. Uh, the markets are at an all-time high. People are talking about subprime crisis. Now his father passes away. And, and, uh, and he gets inheritance from his father. He invests $100,000 blindly again. And the market goes down by 54%. Then, let's say, um, and painting this picture for everyone again, let's say, you know, he falls down hiking on Bukatima Hill. He falls down hiking and breaks his hip. This poor guy, he's just the biggest loser ever. He needs to, he needs to get a, a prosthetic hip. And the doctor says, okay, let's just say hypothetically, the doctor says, I'm sorry, this is going to cost you a million dollars. 
he looks into his account and he invested $400,000. He looks into his account and he has $1.5 million sitting in there, equal to an annualized return of 6.3%. So I guess the moral, and mind you, he invested just a year and a half ago, that last $100,000, which is now worth only $46,000, a really, really horrible outcome. Um, but still, $1.5 million. So he can pay the million dollars and still have his principal. And that is the power of compounding, even if you're the worst investor. And the reason is that in the long run, stocks broadly held have to compensate the stockholders for the risk taken, right? If, if a company goes bankrupt, the bondholders get paid back first. So there is this relationship generally, and if you're very broadly diversified, and to capture these returns. So I would just say, let's say, um, insurance pays off his hip replacement. He holds his money and finally, sad story, sad guy, his wife dies, leaves him $100,000 and he invests right before the COVID crash, right before the oil price, uh, the, oil, the oil wars. The market goes down by 34% in a month. He would still, uh, he would have $5.4 million in the bank. So the moral of the story here is the moral. The moral of the story here is that you know you really need to be time in the market, not trying to market time. And then finally, um, another case study that I just wanted to run through before I end my my stories. Um, I really like the movie 1917. I don't know if anyone watched it. Um, if you haven't watched it, I really recommend it. But it follows a soldier almost, you know, in a in in a in a, um, it feels like a single sequence for the entire movie, right? And this is my terrible graphic, um, but you'll understand why it's drawn this way on the next slide. Uh, essentially, and if you haven't watched the movie and, and you really don't want, I mean, I don't think it's really about the, you can kind of expect what's gonna happen, but if you haven't watched the movie, uh, don't listen to the next one minute of this presentation because <laughs> there's a bit of a spoiler. I mean, okay, so uh, for people who haven't watched it, stop listening for one minute. Okay. Essentially, he wakes up under a tree from a nap and he walks from very nice grassy plains and goes into his friendly camp, into the trenches, um, into the bunkers. And as he progresses through, it gets more and more scary, right? I mean, the sky becomes gray, you see amputated limbs, you see dead bodies, you see rats eating dead bodies, you see people that are hungry and wet and muddy. Anyhow, this is all on, the, on his own side. So this is kind of like preparing to invest, I would say, preparing to be an investor. Then he's asked to go on a mission, which is almost you know, suicidal. He has to go across enemy lines on his own. Well, with a friend, but the friend dies. He has to go across enemy lines, uh, across the barbed wire. So I call it the barbed wire of investment returns uh, to deliver a message to another platoon that they are running into a booby trap because the Germans are waiting for them on the other side. Anyhow, he makes it, he survives. And the movie ends under a tree. He's very relieved. He delivers the message. He saves tens of thousands of soldiers' lives. The movie ends. Now, you'll see this chart underneath. And I'm, I'm going to clean up the chart so we only have the chart itself. And what you can see here is the starting year of investment on, the, on, the, um, on, the, on this vertical axis and the ending year of investment. And I can pick any number and get the total return for starting on that year and ending on that year. So my, my cursor is over this number here right now, sorry, and it's 760, 716% if I started investing in 1974 and I took out my money at the end of 1989. So sorry, it's very small. Uh, we have an Endowist Insights article on this called uh, The Barbed Wire of Investment Returns, Living Through the Trenches and the Barbed Wire of Investment Returns. Now, you see these booby traps, these are the bombs. Okay, so if I started investing in, let's say, 1973, 
and I took my money out in 1974, I would have a negative 37% return. Similarly, if I started investing in, so for example, 2008, and I took out my money in 2009, I would have a negative 23% return. Carry on a few years, and I would have a negative return for a long time. As the colors change, the return profile changes, right? So going back to here, you need to get over the barbed wire of the red and the white to get into the green where you have good returns. So this is coming up with a solution to investing through financial crisis, right? So here's a color key. If it's dark red, it means you have a negative 50 to negative 30% return. Uh, let's skip to white. You have a zero to positive 30% return. Let's go to green, light green, uh, 30 to 200%. And then finally, there are other gradients. We get to the green with white letters, white numbers. And you have a positive 1,000% return. So that's 10x your money. And, you know, we can play this out. Our, we don't know what the future will tell. So right here at the bottom, this is you invest in 2020 Q1 and you take your money out in 2020 Q1 and you see the negative 21% return we were talking about earlier, right? So what you can, and, and what's gonna happen is you might be feeling really, really bad about yourself right now if you invested broadly in markets and you were holding on to this negative 21% return. But what's gonna happen is the same thing. We're gonna get through the red. We're gonna get into the green, the white, positive zero to 30%. We're gonna get into the light green and then the dark green and then the white, where you will be able to achieve your long-term compounded returns by being diversified, by managing your cost and by being patient so that you can capture what we call this compensated risk. So um, this is your 10X wealth area and you need, to, you need to cross the chasm and make it through to that I don't know if you want to call it a, a nirvana of sorts, but I guarantee you, well, I won't say guarantee. So I, I have a pretty high conviction that if we extend out this chart by another 30 years, which is when Tim and I are in our 50s, or sorry, we're in our 60s, Tim, we'll be in our 60s, we will see more white and the white will come down because everything is relative. Right. If you are able to take the broad risk, you can be compensated for taking that broad risk. So um, I have other case studies here, but I'm going to run through it and then go back to some questions. Uh, my final point is that you know the markets can work for you if you position yourself within them. And for many of us, uh, you know, Tim and I are in our 30s. Tim, you're in your 30s, right? Yeah. Okay. Tim and I are in our 30s, and um, we have an investment horizon of not just you know, one year or five years or 30 years. We have an investment horizon, Tim, until we die. And then actually our money will live beyond us. It will live on through the economy and our children and whatever we want to use our money for, like the things we care about. Perhaps that is philanthropy and a foundation. Um, so you need to think long-term and you need to think about capturing higher expected returns. So really quickly here, you know, the US has the best data on uh, the best market data. And if you invested a dollar in 1926 in an asset class that carries a higher enterprise risk, so higher company level risk, let's say US small cap companies, you would have gone down by about 85% a few years later during the Great Depression. But that $1 would now be worth $25,000. If you, if you invest in US large caps, only a slight decrease in the annualized return over the entire period, that $1 would be $9,000. And we get, as we get lower down the risk spectrum, US long-term debt, US short-term debt, US inflation and then cash of a dollar becoming nothing. So I think what's really important as a long-term investor and investing through crises is that we keep things in perspective. 
we need to think long term, ride out the fluctuations. And that doesn't mean trying to get, you know, a 20% return when times are good. Because you can't time when things go bad. So parting, parting thought before we start, we go back to address some questions, Tim. Um, where do you sit on the spectrum? And then how do you access the experts and strategies and products to implement the strategy, to implement your wealth so that it can grow for the long term? And, and that is really what you know, we try to do for ourselves and, and for our clients. I, I really like your chart, you know, and I think the, the barbed wire uh, photos, the one that you, you showed, the, the greens and the reds, I think I just want to add one comment. I think this is a great chart and it clearly shows that in most years and over a long period of time, you will be in the greens more or, more or less. But I think it'll be interesting one day and we should try it if we were to use some leverage and then we would see that the reds will significantly pop up over long periods of time. So I think this, this is a great chart, but I think, and, and I think that's how people should invest. And um, I just want to caution people, if you are if you're using leverage during this period, because you think that the stock market is going down and you want to borrow money to invest, then you're really increasing the odds that you're going to lose money. Because, you know, I, I'm pretty, I can guarantee you that, you know, if we put, two, put a two times leverage right now onto this chart, you know, we will see a lot more rates over greens. And I yeah. think that's one thing. And I think the analogy that you gave about the worst investors, I think that's a great analogy because it shows you that, you know, if you just invest even at the wrong timing, you can make a lot of money and, and you would make more money than, you know, my example of the guy who actually borrowed money to invest in Berkshire, right? So- Oh, yeah, and, absolutely, yeah. So I think that's ironic. So I think a lot of people are very fixated about, you know, investing in the right stock. And I think what, you know, today's, session really shows is that yes, you can invest in the right stock, but if you have the wrong investment strategy, you would still lose money. Um, yeah, I, I think there are some questions that you know we've been asked and we've been told to respond. Um, yeah, so here's a good one. Uh, US stocks recover to 2019 levels while Singapore still has still at 2016 levels. Yet US is worse hit by Corona numbers than Singapore. Can you explain? Exactly. Do you want to take the question? <laughs> sure. I mean, uh, you know, again, it's it's market pricing, right? Um, it is, it is. I mean, I'm not willing to bet against the market in terms of, you know, what you can and cannot control. And actually, this is a good chart to answer the question. Uh, these are developed market returns year by year. And it's, it is a very pretty chart. Uh, Singapore is here in 1999, a positive 99% return, followed by a negative 27% return. So it went from being the second best performer to the third worst performer, so on and so forth. And I am not willing to bet on what this chart will look like going forward. My guess is it will look very similar to what we're looking at now. So the returns are the where the returns will generate, what the countries, the sectors, the stocks that will generate returns is extremely hard to predict. Uh, same chart for emerging markets. And then finally, a regional chart. So a lot of times people say, oh, you know, S&P 500 is great. I just want to invest in the S&P 500. We forget that from the year 2000 to 2009, the S&P 500 actually had a negative return. It had a negative 9% return. So what, what this chart is showing us is light blue is the US S&P 500. Uh, dark blue is the MSCI Japan, the second biggest capital market. And then we have in gray, the MSCI um, EFI, which is developed markets, excluding Japan and excluding the US. And then finally, uh, in pink, the emerging markets. And what we have is the year-by-year -year chart on the right, and then the decade-by-decade -decade chart on the left. And I love to, to, to talk about the decade-by-decade -decade experience. And you can imagine, um, you can imagine, you know, an entire decade is 3,650 days. 
of sitting through markets, reading the newspaper, sweaty palms, beating heart, brokers telling you to buy and sell and buy and sell, um, you know, companies coming out with new news, annual reports all the time. Uh, people showing, you know, I made tons of money and then people saying I've lost everything, right? And, and what you can see is it's very hard to know where returns will come from. So from the 70s to the 80s, that was 20 year period, Japan had a return of almost 400% followed by 11, 11, 1,100%. The US in the same time period had a return of 75%, 76.8, followed by 403.7. So Japan outperformed in the 70s by four times, more than four times. And at that point, you might have said, oh, I, you know, I, I managed to sit in Japan for 10 years straight and win. And you would have felt pretty good about yourself. Right. And then in the 80s, and then in the 80s, Japan massively outperformed again. So if you if you got out of Japan completely, you would have missed out on a 1,100 percent return in the 10 year period. So how can you guess what is going or how can you figure out what is going to be what is going to generate future returns? Yes, we can all look back and say, oh, in that hindsight. You know, Japan was overvalued. They were over levered. We never should have been investing in Japan in the 90s. The price was over the top in the 80s. But how can you time that? It's extremely difficult. Similarly, in the 2000s, you guys remember the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Everyone kept on talking about BRIC, you know, young economies rising out, rising from the dust, you know, rising from totalitarian regimes. Uh, economic and, and uh, global trade friendly policy, opening of the economic systems. Uh, 2000s, emerging markets did the best, but 2010 to 2019, they've actually done the worst. Very hard to guess what, where things, where returns will come from. And it all goes back to you know, the efficient market hypothesis, which is this pricing mechanism of the market and it being too hard to outguess consistently. So I just really urge people, especially in times of uncertainty, to diversify, diversify far and wide. Um, and, and you can achieve that, I mean, thanks to financial engineering and, uh, and you know, the platforms that exist today, you can achieve that in the comfort of your own home. You don't have to go and buy 10,000 stocks. You can do it with a few clicks. Um, and for example, buy into a dimensional portfolio, which has over 10,000 companies on 44 markets. So um, at, a, at an extremely low cost. So I think, you know, find, a, I think what's more important, the most important question to ask yourself is how to position yourself in terms of risk. What is your, what is your risk tolerance? What do you need to achieve your goals? Figure that out and you will sleep better at night. You will be able to live better. You'll be able to invest better and really grow your wealth. Yeah. Okay. I, I think there are some questions and uh, I, I just want to run through some of them, which is being directed to me by my, by my guys. So uh, I think someone has asked about, is this a buying opportunity? And it's re um, so I think uh, it's a good question. I, I, I just want to address the question directly uh, quick and quickly. So, it's definitely a buying opportunities. Um, if you do not invest when markets are low, um, you're basically going to miss out in the long term, right? Uh, but what I would caution, and I think that's something I, I feel strongly about, is that um, it's not a good time to go all in. Uh, very simple fact: we don't know how long the recession is going to be around. So it could be, it could be if we're lucky, three months, six months. But I don't think so. It could be a couple of years. So. Um, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't invest, uh, but you can still invest, but it doesn't mean that you go all in. And I think that's something that's quite important. Uh, you do not want to time the market uh, during a bear market because what goes low can go lower, but you want to start investing as well. Um, yeah, so, so I, think, I think, Tim, to add on that, and we, you know, we have this conversation with a lot of clients, uh, typically it's good to invest or be deploying capital if you have dry powder um, when there's uncertainty. Uh, on average, actually, on average, so this is across ups and downs, 
what we call dollar cost averaging, which is what Tim's referring to. Uh, what we call dollar cost averaging actually is has a poor outcome because 65% of the time the markets go up in a year. Okay, but we are living through a lot of uncertainty. You know, what if the Gilead drug that people are very hopeful about does not live up to its trials? What if? we sink into a second wave and what if plane travel or international travel cannot start for another year so the market is constantly pricing in all this information faster than we can even think about it because you know the tim and greg in the us or in europe have made moves based on this information already i mean the, the, the $450 billion a day has made moves based on this information. So I, I wouldn't say that you, Tim, or I, or anybody listening knows anything more about the market, what the market will do than anyone else. But I would say that in a time of uncertainty, you should deploy, and you may be deploying on the way up, or you may be deploying on the way down and then back on the way up. You should deploy in a very disciplined manner, consistently, regardless of what's happening, until you get to full investment. And the most efficient investor in the long run, so I'm someone who just constantly is trying to optimize my life. So I am fully invested all the time. I have almost no money in my bank account. And when I need money, I just redeem from my portfolio so that I'm maximizing the amount of money that I'm taking at the appropriate level of risk. So that's my philosophy. Um, if, I had, if I had any like larger lump sum payments upcoming that I could foresee maybe in five years, within the next five years, I would de-risk that money. I think right. I just want to add, um, think of this as a... Think of this as a marathon or a run, but you just don't know how long the distance is going to be. So for example, right, you could run very fast. If we know that this is just going to be a two, two kilometers run, it's okay to run fast because you know that the race will finish soon. But the problem now for us during this crisis is that I think we don't really know whether this is a two click run or a five click run or a 10 click run. So it's obviously okay to run fast if you're confident of running fast. But the problem is, you know, what if you're not confident of running fast and then you realize it's not a two click run. It's a five click, it's a 10 click run. Um, you can't just give up at the second kilometer, third kilometer. You got to make sure you pace yourself in a way that you're comfortable with. And I think that's what's really important when it comes to investing. Uh, invest at a pace that you're comfortable with as well. That, that's my, my take um, on, on this topic. Um, there, there are okay, a lot of come, questions. Uh, uh, How much? Time, time uh, do we let's, let's, let's try to end at, um, at 8.30. So we, we, that'd right. be an hour and a half. Um, there's still 250 people um, watching. Okay. So thank you everyone for tuning in. We really appreciate that. Uh, a couple questions I wanted to address. If our investments go into US dollars, what will be your return in US dollars if the US dollar depreciates? Um, so it's very hard to bet on currency. Um, and it's important that, especially your fixed income portfolio, so what you hold in fixed income is hedged back to the currency of your liabilities. Okay, so if you're going to retire in Singapore, then your liabilities are in Singapore dollars. So it's important that your fixed income portfolio is hedged back to Singapore dollars. I would say that um, we can't make a call on, we cannot make a call on what currencies will go up or what currencies will go down when you invest in the global markets, you are owning all of the underlying currencies of those companies. So you're broadly diversified. And then as sort of the powers of the countries change over time, your currency makeup and your currency exposure will also change. So you don't need to make a bet on that. What you're betting on is the equity risk premium and the, and the credit risk premium. So taking compensated risk by investing in the world. Uh, another question, how has the global stock market bottomed out? The markets are so irrational nowadays. And yes, I mean, we saw how irrational the markets are 
you know, in this chart, we saw it here as well. You know, 30, 32% peak to trough, followed by the biggest month um, in the last few decades. <laughs> but, markets, but markets work. You have to be humble as an investor and you have to appreciate that markets work, right? They will find the equilibrium price. Because I'll bring it back to that REIT, Eagle Hospitality REIT versus Amazon. The market is constantly gyrating, trying to find that price. Now, Tim is lucky that I'm not knocking on his door every day, telling him the price of his home, right? So I'm not, I'm not knocking on Tim's door every day, telling him the price of his home. But arguably, you know, home prices in a single market, in a single in, in a single block, in a single neighborhood in Singapore is a far more concentrated bet than investing in, let's say, for example, an Apple with stores all over the world and company and, and a presence all over the world, selling products, goods and services all over the world and online. Yet the price of Apple will gyrate constantly because we have this market mechanism available the stock market mechanism where we can price the assets constantly. So, um, so just keep that in mind when you're investing. And if you're able to catch the market when the prices are irrational and they're, they become quite irrational when there's uncertainty. So that's when the volatility spikes and then we start seeing these huge gyrations, then that's great. If you're disciplined, I would be deploying and trying to catch this uncertainty in the markets. Now, I don't, I don't, you know, like I said earlier, I don't know if you're going to be averaging up your price or averaging down your price, but I would take advantage if you have the dry powder, which the dry powder means money that is not deployed to be, um, to be investing, but only as it, as only as it feeds your goals, right? Only as it feeds your goals and at the correct level of risk. Um, sorry, Tim, do you want to take a question? Um, I, there was a question, uh, and I, I think there was a question about how, you know, I think someone asked a, a good question about investing in the stock market is for the long term and how do I ensure that company will live long and not go bankrupt so that I don't lose all my money. I mean, it's, it's all about not putting all your eggs into one basket, right? So I, I would never want to risk my retirement on one company whether it's Apple, Facebook, or Google, right? I, I would, however, uh, put in to invest over the long term across a, a large basket of goods or even better, the economy itself. I think that's where, you know, uh, having a diversified portfolio and, and I think Endowers offers that uh, those are better bets um, for the long term. Um, I'm not against, just, just to clarify myself, I'm not against tactical bets. So if you feel very strongly about a specific company that would do well, and you, you, you believe very strongly in it, I think it's fine to invest in it. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with making tactical bets. Um, I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with taking a small amount of your portfolio to invest in something which you believe would do well. Uh, but I think in general, for, for the main portfolio, if you are planning for your retirement, if you're planning for something that's important, uh, you don't want to take this kind of risk. Um, and I think that's, that's how you um, ensure that, you know, the company doesn't go bankrupt and you don't lose all your money. Okay. Um, I think we are out of time. Um, really quickly, thank you everyone for dialing in today. Thank you, Tim, for joining us on our webinar. I really enjoyed okay. the conversation. And uh, really quickly, uh, you know, there is a Seedly is hosting something called the Robo Wars tomorrow. For those of you who are interested in dialing in, Sam, uh, my partner, my business partner, and our chief investment officer will be participating in the, in the robo wars. Um, <laughs> and then also uh, next week, uh, Shengxi, one of my colleagues, will be having a discussion on um, how to be financially independent and retire early. So uh, the link should be in the description of the webinar. So please check that out. Thank you everyone for dialing in and spending time with us tonight. Thanks, Tim. Thanks.
Thanks, Rick. See you. Stay safe, guys.